anything for you to do Your hand is moving right now You were still showing up At the tomb of every Lazarus And your voice is calling me out Right now I know you're able Oh my Yeah. 
Warning, use of this product may alter your perception of reality. Everything looks the same. Guys, can somebody hit me with some juice? And listen, pulp, no pulp, doesn't make a difference to me. You're the ones dealing with the diaper. Mom goggles. Have fun glamping. What is that? I have no idea. Uh, we got this. Yep. I mean, think about this. The kids are older. Now they practically take care of themselves. <laughs> Nobody understands me. We're doomed. What did we do the last time they left us alone with the kids? Mom goggles! Those things were so great. I mean, they helped us see things like moms see things. Whatever happened to them? I definitely put them in a place I knew I would never forget. Great! Where are they? I forgot. Uh, computer phone. Order two pair of mom goggles. Ordering two pairs of mom joggers. Nope. Uh, no. Goggles. Mom goggles. young lady. I'm so confused on how I'm feeling. I don't even know why I'm angry, but it feels good to yell. What you're feeling is natural. You truly are a gift from God. And I hope you know I'm always here for you. You're the best dad in the world. I'm sorry I don't tell you that more often. I am going to cry like a man child at your wedding. Stop looking at me. <sighs> oh, laundry. This mess. It is literally a pigsty in here, mister. How are you gonna organize your life if you can't organize your sock drawer? First, it's unmatched socks. Then, unfinished homework. Then, kicked out of school. Next, <gasps> jail. <laughs> How does she process this every day? All right, one more time. Plastic bowls up top, face down, forks up, knives down, plates in the center, pots and pans we wash by hand. Now repeat it back to me. No, I don't think the joggers make you look fat. I've got my dad's thighs. Don't you need the goggles? No. I've seen your mom do this so many times. You have a great mom, you know that. That's great. Mm. Can you hand me the barf bucket? No, okay, here, here we go. <coughs> I got your cat out of the dryer. You're welcome. I don't own a cat. 
How do they do it? Cats? Moms. How do they do all of this without the goggles? They don't need them. <laughs> Moms have this God-given ability. Yeah, it's like no matter what the circumstance, they always see the best version of what their kids can be. Moms are a little glimpse of heaven. <laughs> It wasn't me! morning cherry grove welcome to church this morning all of you out in computer land um, moms are awesome they're special there's something about a mom that a dad a, a dad can't be a mom right i mean i probably i know i wouldn't have survived if it was up to my dad it's because of my mom that i survived um and, and God, our, our existence, how many, how many of you have a mom? <laughs> uh, I mean, get your hands up. We all had a mom, correct? But God chose moms. He chose a mom to bring us our Savior that we have the opportunity to come and worship this morning. Stand. <laughs> Holy 
scripture just kind of jumped out at me and I was where'd that come from kind of this is after John um, Jesus or it's in John but it, Jesus uh, raises Lazarus from the dead and he's riding into um, Jerusalem for the um, Passover feast and so it's just after everybody screaming Hosanna Hosanna and I'm going to start with this one scripture just because it's so good. It's John 12, chapter, or verse 19. So the Pharisees said to other, one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. I just love that verse, the whole world. They're, um, I guess, in, in awe, I guess, is a, a word for it, but they can't believe that everybody is turning towards Jesus. The whole world, they're exasperated is probably a good word for it. But this is what I want to read. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was, be, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Such a simple verse. But their request, all they wanted was to see Jesus. It made me just sit and pause at how often am I coming to church just to see Jesus? I, I come every week and sometimes it becomes routine. And not that that's a bad thing, but do we just come because it's the thing we do? Or are we coming because we want to see Jesus? <laughs> There's a difference there, isn't there? I don't want to just be here because it's what I do week after week after week. I'm coming because I want to see Jesus. There's a posture in my heart that I'm here because I want to hear from him. And so I'm coming before him with open ears and an open heart, and I'm ready to listen to what he has to say. See the difference? Jesus taught me that this week. Hey, are you coming to see me? Are you spending this time with me because you're coming to see me? Absolutely, Jesus. 
I'm coming to see you. Won't we think about that as we continue in song this morning? What a beautiful name Jesus is.
you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my posture, what your heart is. If you're busy, you come here thinking about what's going to happen. It's going to be very hard for you to settle in and hear what the Spirit has to say to you. My hope and my prayer is that you don't you don't come to church to try to just have an experience you know where you're coming just to be entertained because that's not what church is supposed to be about it's the place where you're coming to learn how to worship God you you worship God you're reading those words you're singing those words to God you're understanding what it means it's it's changing your view of who God is you're listening to to the words whether it's in Sunday school or or during a sermon of what God may be saying it's part of the community of faith that was God's design that is his design for the church If, if if you're wanting an entertainment place you can always find a bigger more entertaining church somewhere right There will always be those somewhere. But you always will be missing something inside because it's not going to meet the need that God has for you. This morning as we go into prayer, we got two specifically this Sunday. I mean, there's multiple prayer requests, but we want to remember the teens because our teens 
are getting ready to travel this week. They'll have the leave school Thursday, Friday, Saturday. They'll be at Olivet Nazarene University. Uh, we want to pray for for safety as they travel. Um, Olivet is an hour north of Chicago, and a lot of times you have to go through Gary, Indiana. Caleb understands. Luke understands. Many trips through there. Uh, we, at one point, Carrie and I took a group of teens, and guess what? The van broke down in Gary, Indiana. Right there. The busiest part was not fun. Uh, so we're praying for that. And there'll be over a thousand teens all gathering together on the campus. They're going to com- compete. They're going to be doing things that are, are fun. Every, everything from like art, ping pong to basketball, volleyball, all the, all the different things. But, but it's going to be more than that. We want them to experience God while they're there. There's going to be amazing worship while they're there. And we want God to speak to them. The teenage years are hard. You saw that in that video. We laugh because that's all of us. One, we have been there as a teenager and acted the exact same way. And for parents, you've had teenagers. And you're just like, what is going on here? So we just need to be praying for them. We, we all want to pray for Kevin as well. It's, it's determined he needs a new liver. So, so we just need to pray all that that means okay let's bow our heads and just come before the Lord this morning Lord we thank you for mothers as we come today to celebrate motherhood and that you created it you you designed the whole thing the way that they see us differently than a dad does you you designed that and Lord, sometimes that, that means moms, they have to give up certain things. And it's hard. Sometimes they feel like they're, they're giving up some of themselves. Maybe some of their dreams that they had. And they, there's just a period that's hard. But give them the grace that they need and show them the impact that they're having. Lord, for our teens, we're praying for our chaperones that you, you help them during this time. Keep, keep them safe as they travel down all the different churches. And Lord, they'll, they'll be down there. They're going to be making friends. They're going to be making memories. But we want it to be more than just that. Maybe this is a time that they surrender their lives to you. Maybe this is a time that they, that they feel called by you to do something. Maybe it's to go into ministry. Uh, Maybe it's a certain career path that you're going to use them in. Whatever that is, we're praying for your spirit to move through those three days. Lord, we lift up Kevin and Janet. Lord, he's been through so much. And now to be told that they're going to have to replace the new liver. You're just going to have to sustain them. You're going to have to supply, help that second surgery to go well for his body, to be able to accept it. Lord, for, for Janet, that she, you give her the strength that she's going to need to see a second operation on her husband. Lord, we don't, we don't know what's going to happen. The only thing we can do is lean into you and to trust you. So this day we have gathered together to worship you, to celebrate together. Help us just to trust you, to trust you with our lives, to those that we love, our family. It's all yours. So Lord, we lift this up in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Pastor Julie is going to come up and she has an announcement as we get ready to get started before the kids are dismissed. Yeah. Good morning. Um, So I'm just excited to announce that we are starting a new kids' growth class for our younger kids, ages four to six. So when we dismiss kids for kids' growth, 
Um, if you have anyone, any kids ages four to six, um, they are dismissed as well, and they will be in their own classroom. So a lot of fun things planned, and I just wanted to let you all know. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Kids are dismissed. And, and you know, what a privilege it is because I, I talk to pastors in and they're trying to, to really meet the needs of young families because they, I mean, they're in place in, in life where they just need support and encouragement. The kids are the most willing to accept Jesus, right, as a, as a young, young one, and they, they don't have anything. And here we have a strong nursery. Uh, now we've got pre, I don't even know what we call it, pre something pre kids fourth uh, little kids and then we have regular kids and we have big kids right teenagers adults we got it all draw your swords and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4 and as you do that two quick announcements softball practice for those interested in the softball we got it going on Monday 6 p.m. at the Pines and we also are going to have a work day to help clean up the fields if you are available May 20th and 21st Mark your calendars. We don't have any other information than that. We don't know times, but just mark it on your calendars. We'll have more information coming up. Also, next week is our Faith Promise Sunday, and you are not going to want to miss that. We got exciting things going on. You're going to want to be here for that. Okay. Listen to this poem. Are you ready? Okay. My mommy cuddles me. Kisses me, hugs me, and misses me. She pampers me, praises me, always amazes me. Washes my clothes for me, tickles my toes for me, giggles and talks with me. My mommy goes on walks with me, says sweet dreams to me, sings sweet songs to me. I am so glad she belongs to me, my mommy. Isn't that just cute? That's right. Happy Mother's Day. Since the beginning, God had a plan for the family and for motherhood. And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to go to a passage you wouldn't normally think of, especially for Mother's Day, but to see a truth within it. So turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 through 2 and then 5 through 10. Now Israel, hear the decrees and the laws I am about to teach you. Follow them so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. Do not add to what I command you and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations. You will hear about all these decrees and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to Him? What other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today. Only be careful. Watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Remember. When we look at the human mind and the capacity to memorize and remember, it's really an amazing thing. You think about what children can learn and memorize. When Caleb was in first grade, he's shaking his head because like, he doesn't know where I'm going to go with this. But when he was in first grade, Carrie was homeschooling him. I was like, okay, thank you for correcting me. Kindergarten, doesn't really matter, kindergarten, first grade, come on. So anyways, one of the things that he had to do was he had to memorize scripture. 
and she had like a keychain and an index card. And part of the, the routine was every week you memorize a new scripture, but you also had to know what you memorized the week before. Now, sometimes it's kind of like a dog, right? A dog with a treat, like you're training it. I'm not saying Caleb's a dog. What I'm trying to say here is there has to be incentive sometimes. So the incentive was this. You would get a slushy from the grocery store. And that is a big deal for a little kid in kindergarten. Now that I look back, that probably wasn't very healthy to be giving these gigantic slushies in kindergarten. Anyway, so that, yeah, he loved it. So, but he was memorizing verse after verse after verse in kindergarten. The mind is an amazing thing. I remember hearing a pastor um, who grew up not in the United States uh, he had moved here in his early teenage years, uh, but at some point he went back. He said it was like 30 years later. So if he was 13, it would have been like 40-something. And he wanted to go to where there was a shop around the corner from where they lived who had, they had candies. It must have been like a general store. He called it sweets and treats. So he went in there and he was checking things out and he saw the man, but he, you know, I mean, the guy's not gonna recognize him because he was like 13 the last time he was in there. And as he walked by the shopkeeper, the man grabbed his wrist. He said he was like, you know, kind of startled, like a grown man grabbing my wrist, right? And then the guy leaned in and looked at him in the eyes, called him by name and said, how are you? 30 years later, he remembered him. Some of you probably remember, I've shared about him before, Stephen Hawking. Now, he, he, Hawkins, he, he's now had passed, uh, I think it's been about six years, but when he was alive, he was considered probably one of the greatest scientists outside of Einstein. He was a physicist, cosmologist, and also... Uh, professor of mathematics at Cambridge University. Now, if you were to look at him, you wouldn't think he was a, uh, a professor. In fact, you may even feel bad for him because he had ALS and he was in a little motorized wheelchair and his head, when you see pictures of him, is always kind of bent sideways. He couldn't even talk. Some... Um, group had actually made a computer synthesizer that allowed him to speak or it spoke for him by the twitching of his face in his eyelids he could choose words and in an interview they were interviewing his secretary talking about how smart he was she said one time he had called her into his office and by memory he dictated to her 46 straight pages of mathematical equations. And at the end of it, or near the end of it, he paused and he said, whoa, I need you to go back to page 23. There's one correction I need to make. The human mind is amazing. The ability to remember and to memorize. And now here is Moses, and he's come to a place, the Jordan River, and he's standing at the cusp of it. And before the nation is about to cross the river, and he looks behind at a young nation, he starts having flashbacks of all the things that have taken place. He's starting to remember. And where did it all begin for Moses, do you think? It began in the desert, minding his own business, tending to the sheep of his father-in-law. When all of a sudden, out in the distance, he sees a bush on fire. That seems like a strange thing. So he goes over to inquire of this strange bush that is on fire in the middle of the desert, but it's not burning up. And as he closes in, God speaks to him. And in that moment, he realizes his life is never going to be the same. 
And what does God tell them? He tells them he is going to be the spiritual parent of a young nation. And do you remember what his reply was? Was he excited? Was he jumping up and down? Yay, this is great news. I've always wanted to do that. No. Who am I? How can I do that? I'm not equipped. Who's going to help me? I can't do that. And how does the Lord respond to him? The Lord says, I will be with you. And I think that's often how parenting feels. Your life is about to be dramatically uprooted. Rhythms are going to change. A lot of times you feel inadequate. Sometimes you feel like you're doing it alone. You're overwhelmed. And yet as God said to Moses, he says to you, you're now standing on holy ground. I have a plan for them. I know you feel overwhelmed. I know you feel tired and not equipped. But I will be with you. And now for Moses, like a wise parent, because he knows his time is drawing to a close, he wants to give nuggets of wisdom to this young nation. And so look at verses 1 and 2. We're going to read these over again. Now Israel, hear the decrees and the laws I am about to teach you. Follow them so that you may live and may go and take possession of the land the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. Do not add to what I command you and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. As Moses realizes this is it, he's about to die, he can't help but have flashbacks. And where does that take him? It takes him to where it all kind of began as a young nation coming out of Israel. It comes at Mount Sinai. And here is the event that takes place starting in Exodus 19. On the first day of the third month after the Israelites have left Egypt. So it hasn't been very long. On that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai. And Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. And the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and you keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession." Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. In that that story, on the morning of the third day, there was thunder. I want you to listen to this because this should sound familiar to you. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and there was lightning. There was a thick cloud and a very loud trumpet. Does that sound familiar? Isn't that what we just read in Revelations? Right when the trumpets were, were happening and God opens up heaven and John is looking in. The exact same scene. Everyone in the camp trembled. Trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, and Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. 
And here's what he said, remember. I want you to think about this. How long had it been since they left Egypt? Three months. That's not very long. How long were they in Egypt for? 400 years. This was going to be the first time they really are introduced to God. God is going to give them His moral law. You know, for 400 years, they really didn't know who God was. They didn't know how to worship Him. They didn't know how to follow Him. They didn't know what His moral law was. How many generations is that? If you want to talk about being dysfunctional, I'm not sh Probably very few of us came from a perfect, very good family. I would say probably there's a lot of us who came from dysfunctional families. But could you imagine a dysfunctional family who had a dysfunctional family who had a dysfunctional family for 400 years, how dysfunctional it must have been? That's what they're coming out of. And God is about to reveal to them and break those strongholds and those chains. All the bad habits, all the wrong thinking, all the brokenness. And how familiar is that, I think, sometimes to young moms or to a mom in general, regardless of age? I think you can look back and you may not have a head a godly example. It's possible you've grown up with brokenness in your home. It is no different from the Israelites. And yet this is what God said to them, and it's the same thing he's saying to you, but I have chosen you to be my treasured possession, to be my kingdom of priests and a holy nation and I will help you. And immediately following that chapter, God tells them and gives them the Ten Commandments. And here's what he says. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol in the form of anything or worship it. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. In a world struggling with absolutes, you, the person they trust the most, is able to let your children know there are absolutes in life. The law of God is absolute. That they are created in the image of God is absolute. That God can forgive them is absolute. That if they trust in God, they can have a future. That's absolute. Do you know what the largest or one of the main issues most teenagers deal with today? It's trying to find meaning. Meaning and purpose in life. And when you tell them about origin about morality, about value and destiny when they're young. So origin, that they were not an accident, but God created them. Morality, that there is a such thing as a right and wrong. It's not your truth. There is only but one truth. That they are made in the image of God, and because of that, regardless of anything, they have value and destiny there is going to be a day where we have to stand before God but that we were created to be eternal you when you help them and especially when they're young you help plant stones that will guide them when they begin struggling with the questions of life. Verses 9 and part of 10. Let's read that real quick. Only be careful and watch yourself. 
closely so you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your life from your heart as long as you live teach them to your children and to their children after them remember and what did Moses remember he remembered the Israelites being slaves and held by the bondage of sin he remembered seeing the plagues and the hand of God miraculously free them he remembers the pillar of fire at night and the pillar of cloud that led them in the desert when they didn't know which way to go he remembers how God provided manna, quail, and water where there should have been no food or water. He remembers how the people grumbled and how he had to pray for them. He remembers his own brother and sister grumbling against him, the very people he was closest to him that he trusted and how it hurt him. He remembered breaking one of God's laws and that was now keeping him from entering the promised land. Moses remembered both the good and the bad, and now he's telling the people so that they would remember. I want to leave you with these two short little illustrations. A pastor was sharing um, at a conference he had been invited to the Middle East. And when we think of the Middle East, a lot of times we think that God isn't doing very much, with, especially with all the wars that are going on over there. And I don't remember all that had transpired for this to happen, but he had been invited to speak to one of the head sheiks in Syria. And they had an interpreter between them. And as they were there, um, the sheik wanting to honor the pastor kept on calling him the professor. And he told him he wasn't a professor, but after a while he stopped correcting him. But during the conversation, he said that he would ask questions about his faith and he would share. And then he would turn around and, and ask him questions about his faith. He said it was really a remarkable thing to think people with two completely different worldviews could actually dialogue and have a conversation. And he said this went on for three hours, but he began seeing the countenance and kind of the walls of the sheik come down during those three hours. And finally, at the very end, with just a a vulnerability and sincerity he leans forward and he says something in his own language which he didn't understand and he looks at the interpreter and he, and he says you know what is he what is he saying and the interpreter says he is saying that maybe it's time for him and his people to stop asking if Jesus died on the cross and start asking why And I share that because the whys of life are going to come from your kids and you have the privilege to tell them that their greatest need will not be in a political leader. It won't be in the best college. It won't be in finding a perfect job or having a lot of money. But their greatest need will be for a savior because deep within the human heart is evil and it wants to take it captive. But Jesus has come to set the captive free. Yesterday we, we were able to share Max's second birthday and his vocabulary really is limited to about two main words, mommy and juice. Although a close third is papa. Carrie knows it to be true. Um, there was a, a four-year-old boy who had an amazing vocabulary. Uh, he once had asked his mom, Mommy, what, what does sophomoric mean? Huh? That's pretty incredible coming from a four-year-old. Well, one day uh, the mom was running late for, for work and he, she had to get the little tyke to daycare 
and she lost her keys and she's scrambling all over the place. Now, dads, can you already picture the scene? A mom running late, a little kid, chaos starting to come out. She's scrambling around. She's going to be late for work and, and just panic stricken, right? Panic stricken. Now, to a dad, he kind of knows what to do in those moments, right? Just get out of the way. But for a little kid, they don't. And the younger a kid is, the more there's a sense of wonder and literalism to everything that they watch, everything that they see. And when they see a, a mom panicking and getting out of control, it, it becomes part of them. And finally, that young mom slaps her head Where's my keys? I'm losing my mind. And then she starts really thinking hard where she put those keys, and out of nowhere, she feels something strange. And she realized the little guy had walked over and had grabbed her finger. And she looks down, and with such a vulnerable, tender heart, he looks up at her mo his mom and his eyes are whelming up with tears. And he said, Mommy, whatever you do, don't lose your heart because I'm in there. So I say to you moms out there, where did that thought come from? There is a longing within every human heart to be loved to be loved by a parent to be loved by a spouse but there is no greater need than to be loved by your creator and moms you have the opportunity to tell them about the love of Jesus would you stand You know, for Moses, there were times he did not want to lead the people. He was done. He wanted to give up. He wanted someone else to do it. But in the end, he knew God had called him, had called him to lead that God would teach him what he needed to know to help him model before the people how to live and to help them remember. And now God is calling you to do the same. Parenting and motherhood is not easy. There will be times you feel overwhelmed. There will be times you wish someone else would just do it. But God has placed them in your care. And now he is asking you to help leave memory stones for the ones who call you mommy. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the gift of moms and motherhood. I'm drawn back to Wednesday night as we were watching the chosen and talking around them, our table. That Mary, sharing with the disciples, what was it like what was it like to have him? What was it like when he was born? What was it like as he was growing up? And she shared how she sometimes had missed that little boy because Joseph had died at a, at a young age and she said he, had, he, had, he just grew up so fast. He really doesn't need me. He hasn't needed me in a long time. And 
in the very end of the video, as he's coming in after healing people all day long, his body just wore out, shaking from exhaustion, in pain, isn't even able to clean his own feet. And Mary comes over and starts washing him. And Jesus looks at his earthly mom. Mom, what would I do without you? Whether your children say it or not, that is how they feel about you. You are their mom. And they hold you in high esteem. May the Lord help you and bless you as you continue to pour into your family. Because motherhood is a gift. And you are so precious to them. May God remind you this week. May his hand be upon you. And Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Mother's Day.